Welcome back to Anthropology 347, Native Peoples of the Southwest. We are now in week four, so nearing the completion of the class. Today where the lecture is going to be short, um, and because I, I want everyone to take some time with the readings and also uh, have thoughtful discussion posts. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, performing Southwest Native identity amongst uh, two groups, both the Western Apache and the Rio Grande Pueblos. But before we get started today, I just wanted to remi remind everyone to uh, turn in homework three. It's going to be due at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. And also, please remember to post twice to the discussion boards this week, both Tuesday and Thursday, and also next week, even though it's a truncated week. Our last day of class is on Wednesday. There will also be two discussion posts. And these are easy points. You guys are doing a great job, so please remember to keep up on those. Today we're going to be talking about identity, specifically Native American identity in the Southwest. But identity is one of those kind of interesting uh, and social constructs where identity can both be um, assigned to other people or can kind of be ascribed to by yourself. So for instance, the uh, state and the university all identify you as students of the University of Arizona. However, if you're traveling or um, go home or on an airplane or a bus and you start strike up a conversation with somebody, you might say, I'm a student at the University of Arizona. So identity is both given to you and also um, expressed by you. And identity works at multiple scales. And so we all have multiple identities that we ascribe or put into. So the readings this week kind of talk about how do culture, history, and place all kind of contribute to this identity. Also, another thing that we're going to be discussing is how do we define ourselves by defining others? So by defining others and assigning identity to others and what we're not, what does that say about what we are? And the third point is, is how does the appropriation of other people's cultural forms and traditions kind of work in defining you know, one's own culture? So how can these uh, forms and conceptions of the world kind of be adopted? to express uh, you know, unique cultural and social identity. The first reading we're going to be looking at this week is uh, a series of chapters by Keith Basso in his book, Portraits of a White Man. Um, Basso, who is retired from University of New Mexico, uh, still does uh, limited field work, but conducted most of his field work for this book in the 1960s and 70s. And Basso's main point in this book is to try to, quote, understand how people make sense of how other people make sense. And he's trying to understand Western Apache identity um, and also Apache uh, relationships with mainstream American social and political culture um, by trying to understand how the Apache themselves um, identify and stereotype and characterize uh, the, quote, unquote, white man. And this portrait of the white man that the Apache come up with and make in these, in, these, in these pretty hilarious jokes only really makes sense within the context of the relationships, mostly historical context, between the Apache and the quote-unquote white man or the um, non-Native American and how they fit together. And so as we've uh, read a lot in the last few weeks, the history of Native Americans in the Southwest is oftentimes one rife with uh, difficulties with forced um, assimilation, uh, population movement, oppression. But the Apache um, talk about this history and the relationship with the white man in very different um, way than you would expect. It's, it's mostly kind of a derogatory joking way and it can tell us a lot about Apache history and identity. Um, a lot of these jokes that you'll read about in the Basso chapters um, revolve around this uh, systematic code switching and this is just an anthropological term code switching for changing languages um, strategically to um, you know, have more meaning in a conversation. So Basso talks about these jokes, and much like uh, Dave Chappelle, when he um, goes into his great imitation of the white guy, that's what the Apache um, and CBQ do as well. When they want to um, really ramp up the joke and make it hilarious, uh, they'll start speaking in English and start saying very un-Apache but very kind of white guy things 
and everyone thinks it's hilarious. And they're making kind of a social commentary on Apache US relations. This humor is an important means of um, kind of managing social relationships and, and dealing with the challenges of uh, contemporary life. This joking around is what anthropologists consider an act of a play, but it's really based on actual scenarios, and it's really, you know, funny because it's true. Um, the, the reason most humor has any kind of impact is because there's a kernel of truth, and sometimes that kernel of truth is relatively, relatively large. Um, jokes simultaneously are funny and dangerous at the same time. Basso talks a lot about, um, you know, these hilarious jokes about the white man that sometimes just go too far. And um, what if nobody gets as a joke? What if someone thinks you're serious? So this, uh, Basso discusses that joking about the white man or imitating the white man is really a very kind of dangerous, dangerous kind of joke, but also some of the most effective. Um, there are really two larger functions to attend to in these jokes. Uh, the joker is saying, um, not only saying something about the butt of his joke, I think one of the quotes in the article was, the white man is stupid, that's the main theme, um, but also there's a larger overarching frame that these jokes are um, discussing, and that is kind of the relationship between the Apache and non-native United States culture. And there, so there's a social commentary within these jokes as well. But really, understanding the humor lies in understanding Apache cultural values. You know, it's always hard to analyze humor. And whenever you analyze humor, it's not funny anymore. But I think Basso makes a really good point on saying that, you know, by really going, really ramping up the white man, quote unquote white man traits, they're so not Apache in terms of tradition and culture. And these are sometimes the most funny but also the most kind of dangerous sorts of jokes. And these jokes really reflect the underlying issues of race and ethnicity in the U.S. in the 1960s and 70s, and would continue to the present and still do. But you can see some of these issues are really based on the civil rights era when this work was conducted. Um, this is a very short thumbnail sketch of this article, but please take a look at this and and discuss it in the discussion board because I think this is probably one of the best articles we'll read this semester in terms of um, not only is it readable and funny but it also really gets to the heart of Native American humor and identity formation. The second article this week also discusses um, Apache identity and Samuels talks about how in the 1960s small rock bands uh, popped up all over the Apache reservation and this was in light of the encroaching Americanization of the West and rural areas of the country. And this is really related to um, the spread of, um, of radio technology um, as people start to listen to more mainstream rock and roll and mainstream society in general. Um, but Samuels talks about that these bands popping all over, up all over the place were really important for other reasons. Um, they were really a kind of a binding and bonding um, part of the community. And that these small bands, while they were kind of incorporated in these larger mainstream society and mainstream music scenes, um, but at the same time, these bands uh, and this, these, these mainstream cultural traditions that were adopted by you know, non-native U.S. were kind of adopted and appropriated to express a really unique uh, Apache identity. Well, these bands didn't come from, from nowhere. Uh, music and singing was originally part of the missionization effort uh, brought onto the Apache Reservation in the late 1800s. Um, and the performance of these bands in the 1960s um, really uh, under the threat of assimilation that we read about in the last few weeks uh, really became a part, an important part of expressing a unique Apache identity. Um, and like, uh, like the Basso's article on joking about the white man, these seemingly kind of benign acts really had a, a large social commentary included with them. And these included elements of race, class, gender, 
ideologies that really emerge to these performance. Um, but uh, so this music holds the keys to identity, um, but also was really fluid and flexible and really kind of complicated the picture of Indian versus Anglo um, as, as something where Native Americans were both appropriating these very kind of mainstream American uh, conventions of, you know, starting a three-piece rock band, but also um, making it unique and making it their own. And so this kind of uh, power relationships, social and political relationships, are really expressed through the seemingly benign uh, playing of, of rock music. The third article for this first half of the week also discusses language and identity. But in this case, Devonport writes about uh, the uh, Atiwa Pueblo in um, the, the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico writing uh, a soap opera in native Tiwa language. And this is just another kind of play. In the case of writing a soap opera, this was a project for language learning and revitalization on the Pueblo. But as the article points out, it's really a melding and mixing of genres and languages to really express values and identity. And so just like rock bands among the Apache, this sort of benign or seemingly benign form of mainstream American culture is appropriated by the Pueblos. And the resulting soap opera that comes out is not only a um, expression of Pueblo identity, um, and, but it also is kind of a social commentary on the relationships between the Pueblos and mainstream American society. Uh, because this was part of a language revitalization effort, um, the soap opera was also used as a means to understand um, the connectedness to the past and, and recent ch changes in Pueblo life. And so why I'm talking very shortly about this, please take a look at this because it deals with many of the same issues of appropriating mainstream American culture and making it very unique and um, a very unique representation of Native American identity. So as we get going with this week, I just wanted to bring up a few points to think about for you when you read and for the discussion posts and for the uh, assignment. So, so what? Well, cultural groups define themselves um, through linguistic practices such as language and such as joking, singing, etc. We saw this in all three articles for this week. Uh, but defining what you are not really does offer clues into what you are. And this was seen specifically in Basso's article about uh, the portraits of the white man. Um, history and place really figure into culture, identity, and how your cultural values are expressed. And these historical trajectories and frameworks are always a part of uh, who you are. And this is really expressed in the different kinds of media that we've read about this week. And, uh, but these practices and performances are constantly fluctuating in meaning and form, and this makes sense because they do reflect the social and political dynamics between Native American peoples and mainstream societies. And this is a relationship that constantly changes and evolves uh, through time. And so please take a look at the readings this week, and if you have any questions, let me know. And we're very close to being finished with the class. <laughs> so thanks a lot, and I will talk to you soon.